You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Laurel K. Hamilton on the show with me. She has an amazing new book, and it's the first book in a brand new series. It's the Zaniel Havelock series, and the new book is called A Terrible Fall of Angels. What an exciting thrill ride uh, of a book that, you know, if you love fantasy and and uh, modern fantasy, this is going to be right up your alley. And this needs to be in your to be red pile, uh, you know, especially as the weather's changing. It's getting a little cooler around the country um, and, uh, you know, we kind of get in the mood for uh, for some some great, uh, comfortable uh fantasy fiction and a terrible fall of angels definitely fits that bill and uh, we're here to talk about it today welcome to the show laurel well thank you so much hank for having me and uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction for a terrible fall of angels my new book i love it and i, I know other people are too um but before we get into talking about that and there's so much to talk about we begin each show with the same question every time and that question is what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Uh, of literally wanting to be a writer, not just that I love stories or words, but literally wanting to be a writer. Yeah. Okay. Um, I started trying to write stories when I was 12, 12 and a half, because for many years, all my protagonists were exactly my age down to the month. And um, so I started trying to write stories when I was about 12 and a half, never finished any. And I remember, uh, like most people, I started out imitating what I read. And um, I know it's going to, everybody's always surprised when I say that my first hero for writing was Louisa May Alcott of Little Women, Little Men, uh, Little Men and everything. Uh, But Louisa May Alcott supported her extended family. She never married, but she supported her extended family through her writing. And that's in the 1800s. Um, and that was unheard of for a woman to support that many people through her writing. So having a woman, instead of a dead white guy, it was a woman who had actually supported her family through her writing. And I read that in one of the book's introductions. And I remember thinking to myself that 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 was one of the first historical female writers that I came across as a child. And so I don't know, it just gave me kind of hope that I could do it, too. And uh, since, you know, this century is more modern um, and I was trying to imitate that, I remember trying to imitate to 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 do my own little version. And I never finished a story because, of course, um, it wasn't my style. And I didn't know that uh, I would learn years later that Louise Malcott had actually written a lot of horror. There's a horror and a pulp. I, I didn't know that. Yes. She wrote for the the Penny Dreadfuls. And she actually uh, would have written more, but it did not sell for her uh, as much as the book she's more known for. And if you read the original Little Women without it being uh, edited for content, it's it's full of uh, suffragette and, and, and women's rights. But most people never read the whole book. They read the book that's been edited down for children, in quotes. And so it takes a lot of the uh, a lot of the the pro women women's rights out of it. Wow, I I didn't know that, and and I didn't know that I was going to learn so much about Louisa May Alcott today. What a that that's amazing. How how did you uncover those those details about her and and the original, um, you know, subject matter of Little Women? Well, I started. I started out by uh, it, one of the library books, not Little Women, because I, I had that as a is a originally like a, an edited. I didn't realize it was edited for many for a while, but Little Women and the Eight Cousins, some of her other books. In one of them, in the library, it had a little bio about her supporting her family, and that led me to actually look up 
uh, books on her and about her life. Um, library is an absolute godsend, especially when you are raised below the poverty level, because there's no yeah. way you'd have access to those books uh, otherwise. So um, I, I learned it from a bio in the back of one of her books that I researched it myself. And um, I've always been I've always been really good at research, even as a child. And um, and it took me years of therapy to realize why I'm so awesome at, at, at research and why I am so dedicated to a lot of research for things, in my writing and in life. And that is that my my grandmother who raised me, um, she thought I read too much, even though she gave me my love of reading by reading to me. And she thought I read too much. And she told me that I would read so much I would go blind like Helen Keller. Oh my and, goodness. And I, and I, and I was going, I don't think Helen Keller went blind from reading grandma, you know, and, and she, she, but her father had told her that. And so she told me that and anything that my, uh, that her father, my great, my great grandfather had said was gospel to her. Um, so I actually got a biography of Helen Keller's teacher, um, Annie, oh, I forgot her last name. I'm blanking, um, from school on the scholastic book thing. Yeah. And brought it home and showed her that scarlet fever had blinded, had, had been the thing that had taken poor Helen Keller's sight. It had been scarlet fever as a baby. And I showed it to her in the book and she had to concede my point. Um, and the same way about explaining other things that were incorrect, but she believed adamantly I would have to go and find facts in a book and show it to her. And I, I finally realized that having to prove <laughs> to my parental figure that these things are not true started my my love of research and what finding research to back you up could do for you uh so you know it's funny at the time it's frustrating but it can set, some things that are so frustrating as a child can really set you up for success later on as an adult absolutely um since we were talking about this, Laurel, I, I love to hear about where people are from and and to look at what influence um, that sense of place uh, might have on their later writing career and, and how it maybe seeps in in unexpected ways or things that that the pedestrian uh, you know reader may not pick up on. Um, if I understand right, you were born in Arkansas, but but raised in uh, Indiana. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. Um, do you do you ever feel that uh, that a sense of place, Arkansas or uh, Indiana, has a way of seeping into the stories that you tell? No, no. Um, I was raised in Indiana, but it's never it was never home. I've never gotcha. liked. I, um, I'm still seeking home. I prefer the mountains and the ocean to flatland. I've never. It's 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 just. Uh, I don't know. I, I woods, forests. There was a there's a for there was a set of woods near my home that was one of my favorite places to go. Um, but we didn't own it, so it was burned down to make more farmland, room for more farmland. Um, uh, sense of place. The the biggest sense of place, and again, years of therapy um, to realize <laughs> that the sense of place in my books is cemeteries. Interesting. Um, my mother died when I was six in a car accident. My grandmother then raised me after that, my maternal grandmother. And um, I remember going to uh, going to the cemetery a lot as a child. And uh, I remember, you know, we would always fresh flowers, uh, a Christmas blanket, you know, a Christmas gray blanket in this winter. So it would always be green on their grave. Uh, my grandmother never recovered from my mother's death. She was the youngest of five of her five children. She never recovered from it. And um, uh, so I remember cleaning my mother's tombstone with a toothbrush wow. as a child because because my grandmother couldn't bear for it to be dirty. And so I remember cleaning the lettering with a toothbrush. And um, I spent so much time in the cemetery that my mother was buried in as a child or it's and everything that um, I set the very first Anita Blake story, which is Those Who Seek Forgiveness, which is now uh, in my short story collection, Strange Candy. 
that cemetery that that story is set is the cemetery where my mother was buried. Wow. Oh man, that that just makes chills run down my spine. That uh, as I can only imagine what uh, what sort of impact that has on on a youngster. And then, um, d- d- does your your love of fantastical stories and characters and imagery? Um, uh, it would seem like that that there's a there's a connection there from early childhood trauma and um, you know the the way you deal with that. That, that does some of that come out in in your storytelling? Oh heavens, yes, yes. Um, it would take me years of of in, introspect, introspection to realize it, but yeah. Sure. Um, uh, originally, Anita Blake only raised the dead. The vampires came late in the process of writing the first book, Guilty Pleasures. And um, it, it, as I said, you know, you have insights, layers of insights as you go along. And I finally realized um, that I I was talking to one of my friends, not actually during all this last 18 months. And I said, we're talking about shared child childhood trauma. And I said, the only thing that would have made my grandmother happy is if I could have raised my mother from the dead. Mm -hmm. And that little bell goes off. You go, damn it. That's where that comes from. Every once in a while, I would rather not know <laughs> where some of right. my fuel comes from. But yes, uh, I was raised with the dead. My gra- my mother's death, my mother's death would never leave my grandmother. And so it was a permanent daily thing for me. Almost every day of my life as a child, she says, well, I'm going to die soon. So you better be ready to go someplace else. And even though she lived to see me, you know, she lived to see her granddaughter, uh, her great granddaughter, my daughter. Um, But I was raised with that level of impermanence of being told every day that my grandmother, who was, you know, who was older, who could die any day and that I would have no one. I'd have to go to one of my aunts or uncles or somebody. And it is it left me with a it left me with a level of impermanence of 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 not trusting to the adults around me, to the people around me, to take care of me, because no one's coming. That was my message from childhood. No one's coming. If you're in trouble, no one's coming. Um, uh, I, I have I, m- one of my best friends it was uh, in foster care, and we have a lot of the same trauma for very different reasons, but it's that lack of impermanence, that lack of not trusting to your stability around you. And... Um, Couple that with being raised with my grandfather. Now they divorced by the time I was born. I did not witness it, but I was raised on the stories of him beating her for 20 years. Mm. And and the family all agreed on this. This is what he did. But yet he was allowed to visit either visit us every summer or we visited him. And um, so, you know, the the I write about monsters because my grandfather who had tried to kill my grandmother on many occasions. And she fought back for 20 years. She didn't win, but she fought back for 20 years. Also taught me to catch butterflies the one summer. I remember that in the August heat. And he, to hold them by the thorax, hold them gently so you didn't damage their wings so we could look at them and then you had to let them go. He was so kind to animals, so gentle. And yet he was so horrible to her. And it was just that juxtaposition of, of as a child trying to deal with, on one hand, this horrible fact of violence and couple that with somebody who loved you and was gentle with you. And, you know, it's no wonder I write, I write monsters and that most of my monsters turn out to be better human beings than the human beings. <laughs> well, that was going to be the, the next thing I asked was um, the... It, it, it's crazy how these archetypes uh, kind of work into uh, into the stories that we tell or into the you know the, these scenarios that we create and um, it it's easy on the surface to make two dimensional characters and for the bad guys to be the bad guys but one thing that that you have done in in your series that you've written is to show that that three dimensional aspect of characters and that that the bad guys air quotes and the good guys are are not that uh, that easy to define and you know what what is it about you know showing the 
the good and the bad and the the three dimensional nature of characters that excites you so much? Well, one, it's just good writing. Uh, yeah. Two, um, my life experience has not taught me that people are just plain good or plain evil. My experience growing up from my youngest memories is that people are multifaceted, that the same person that is supposed to take care of you and keep you safe also does great harm to you. I, I, um, uh, that you're, that you, everyone, I give everyone a chance to be a nice human being, but I've learned to not give them a chance to hurt me if they're, I'm wrong. And by that, I mean, you know, I just expect people to be horrible. I, I, I don't trust that they're not going to be. So when I sit down to write, you know, uh, I bring that with me. I, nobody is one thing. Most people, if you talk to them who've done evil things or bad things, um, I, they don't think of it as evil. They didn't mean it as evil. They have some rationalization in their head. One of the interesting things in talking to police over the years is that um, that the bad guys, even the mo okay, I don't mean sociopaths. I don't mean people that have no empathy. Sure. But people that are bad guys that are going to mug you or something, but it's because they need money for drugs or they need money for whatever. They're 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 criminals. But even they need a reason to up the violence. They don't want to start out that most people don't want to start out being violent. But if you hold on to your purse, that can be enough to blame you. You won't give me what I want so I can beat you. And most people are like that. They want to be the good guy of their story. They want to feel justified and not be not be the bad guy in the story. And and you just and when dealing with people, people are hostile to you. Unless you can throw overwhelming force at them, you just sit there and don't give them a reason to up the violence. You don't give them a reason to blame you. Whatever they do, try to make sure that it's them that does it. It's them that chooses. Because most people do not want to be the villain of the story. Um, and my definition of evil, actually, um, uh, a road the, uh, is that if you somebody does something to harm you and you tell them that that hurt you in some way and then they modify their behavior, they're not evil. They're ignorant. They need to be educated. They need to be taught taught that this was harmful and hurt your feelings or hurt you physically. And if they modify their behavior from that point on, they're not evil. They just needed to learn how to treat you better. Sure. But if you tell them that this hurt my feelings and they keep doing it and they don't give a shit, then they're evil. They've chosen to hurt you and continue to hurt you. That's evil. Um, that is my definition of evil. But people who do not think of themselves as evil can still kill you. People who do not think of themselves as evil can still beat you senseless. People who do not think of themselves as evil but think of themselves as justified in what they're doing can do an awful lot of harm. And But in their own minds, in their own story in their head, they are not the bad guys. Now, occasionally you run into people who don't care if they're the bad guy. They embrace it. If you tell them that this hurt me, they will look you in the face and they will say, I don't give a shit. It hurt you. Right. They're dangerous. They're absolutely dangerous because they have no stopping point. You can't manipulate them. You can't appeal to them with tears. You can't, you can't appeal to them on the basis of being another human being. They don't care. And they're out there. There's a lot more of them than you want to think. Yeah. Authors, I have a fantastic new service to tell you about. It's called PubSite. PubSite is a service to help you build your very own website, your home on the web, where you can promote your work and give your fans a place to connect with you. PubSite is a website platform that allows every author, regardless of budget, to have a great-looking professional website developed by the book marketing professionals at FSB Associates. PubSite is the new easy-to-use DIY website builder developed specifically for books and authors. Whether you're an author of one book or 20 or a small publisher, PubSite allows you to build, design, and most importantly, update your website pain-free. 
No need to be dependent on a designer or webmaster to make a small but costly change to your website. Save the money and do it yourself. PubSite is the best platform for authors because it's a book-centric platform. PubSite was built just for authors and small publishers. Every design, feature, and layout is book-centric. They have customized designs for you to use. It's easy to build. No coding or HTML is necessary to create a stunning, professional-looking website with all the features you want. Get a custom domain name, yourname.com. It's simple to update. You can add all of your books, add a blog and a book tour, sell from any retailer, manage your email list and social media, and even do e-commerce. Build your website with a 14-day free trial, then pay just $19.99 per month, which includes hosting. And we offer packages starting at $499 to set up the website for you. Pub-Site.com, the place to help authors find their home on the web. What Death Taught Tarrant by Derek McFadden. Life is a journey, so is the afterlife. At the end of his life, Terrence McDonald must discover its meaning or he'll be banned from the afterlife forever and his soul will cease to exist. Join Terrence and those who love him on a poignant and unforgettable journey through a life at once wonderful and harrowing. Learn what Terrence learned. See what Terrence sees. By this provocative story's end, readers may even learn a thing or two about themselves. See why people are saying things like, Derek McFadden writes with an insight you can match. If you like the works of Mitch Album, I think you'll find What Death Taught Terrence a worthy addition to your library and the reading of it, a life-affirming journey. I found this story immediately immersive and it stuck with me long after I finished. What Death Taught Terrence by Derek McFadden on sale now. Well, um, the, was was guilty. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Not exactly where you thought this conversation was going to go. <laughs> no, no, but I'm happy it did. Um, this is this is great. Um, did was Guilty Pleasures the first book that you published? Uh, no, the first book I published was Nightseer which is my first novel I ever wrote. I, I'm one of those rare writers that the first book I wrote actually was good enough to be published. Um, Nightseer is um, Elves, Dwarves, and Dragons. When you read the book over, you will know that I played D&D for many years. <laughs> and I, I actually, strangely enough, um, one of the things I've done, did in the lockdown was read all my books in order. Now, Nightseer is Night Seer is a standalone. It was supposed to be part of a four book series, but the first book didn't sell well enough, as most first novels don't. Right. And so they didn't want the second one. Um, but I'm reading it over and I'm going, you know, I, it's still good. I still like it. And you can still see echoes of this character reminds me of like there's one character in there, Lothor. And I go, oh, it's Baby Frost. It's like Frost from the Mary Gentry books. It's right. it's that character except done differently and in, in, in but I can see the echo of it and I'm going wow okay there's that there's that there's that um but that was the first one guilty pleasures was actually the fourth novel I published because when they didn't want my second novel I contacted my agent I said what am I going to do I thought my career might be over before it started um and she got me a uh uh, Star Trek, the next generation novelization that I was able to do called Nightshade. And then I also did a, um, um, I did a uh, TSR book, uh, Death of Dark Lord uh, for them. So those two are in the middle and then Guilty Pleasures would be my fourth published novel. So Guilty, Pleasure, a- Guilty Pleasures kicked off the Anita Blake series. Um, or- Guilty Am Pleasures I- started my career, and what do I mean by that? Your first book does not start your career in publishing. If you talk sure. to, you know, what your first success, the thing that makes you, if you if you are if you're one of those writers that is lucky enough to become a number one New York Times bestselling writer and stuff and hit the top of the USA Today list kind of thing, then whatever book started your rise, that's where you count your career start from. So Guilty Pleasures, the first Anita Blake novel for me. 
Am I right that there are 28 books in that series? You are right. You are that, absolutely right. That is an incredible run. Um, you know, as someone that that had a few um, starts and stops before Guilty Pleasures came out and, you know, you were finding your footing and and what would become your voice that that people love and, and keep coming back from or keep coming back to. Um, could you imagine that that Anita Blake would carry you as far as she did and, and that the the story would go as deep and complex as it as it has? Oh, heavens no. But in fact, I remember when they bought Get the Pleasures, they bought it as part of a three book contract. My first novel, Night Seer, was a one book deal, and then they had an option for the second novel. But when they bought Guilty Pleasures, they the original contract was for three books. And I remember when I signed it and saw it, I remember thinking, at least there'll be three books. And I was so happy because <laughs> it had been such a blow to have Night Seer and nobody wanted the rest of the series. That that had been a really hard on me as a, as a new writer, any writer. But at the very beginning, it had been really really devastating blow and so the fact that there was going to be three novels i was so excited and now here i am i mean when i get off the uh, uh off the interview with you i will be sitting back down to writing the 29th anita blake novel wow and you know um and i'm still learning new things about the world new things about the characters it's and still having a great time playing in the world and, you know, it's it's one thing to be successful. It's another thing to still be lo in love with what you're writing in a long running yeah. series. Yeah. Well, and besides that series, um, you also write the Mary Gentry series. And then now you're kicking off a brand new series with Daniel Havelock. Um, yes. What, what, what is the difference for you? I mean, uh, aside from the the obvious surface differences of of writing um you know, uh, an existing series like Anita Blake, and then, you know, spinning up a whole new universe with new characters um, like Zaniel Havelock. What, where does the, um, how do I say this? Um, what's the, what's the allure of starting a new series where, you know, the, the rule book is, is kind of wiped, uh, the slate is wiped clean and you can do whatever you want to do um, as opposed to the comfort and the existing universe that you have built so meticulously over so many books, so, you know, with Anita Blake and, um, you know, the existing playground um, versus a, a blank slate. What, what's the creative process difference like in those two scenarios? Well, interestingly enough, I have a better answer for why the Mary Gentry series exists. And okay. that that is, um, again, therapy is a wonderful thing. It took me years to figure this out. Um, I was trying very hard not to have any sexual content in the Anita Blake series. Um, I never planned to have sexual content uh, like I do in the series. And so the Mary Gentry series was in some ways created so I could have a character that was more comfortable with sexual content and uh, that side of her personality. So I and also, I mean, they're nature spirits, the, the fair nature spirits. And um, that is very much about you know, what makes life go round? Is it really better to kill or to make love, war not love kind of thing or whatever? So I I really created that to have all the, the spicy stuff in one place and keep it out of Anita. I would write the first uh, Mary Gentry novel, A Kiss of Shadows, and then I would write the 10th novel for Mary, for Anita, which was Narcissus and Chains, and that is when the spicy just the spicy sex just got completely took me over. So apparently, I personally was just ready to write it, and um, I was in my first marriage, and I was monogamous, and I I would end up being in that marriage for 16 years. But when I had just written, uh, I had almost written completely completed Narcissus and Chains. And I was in the middle of writing the second Mary book when my 16 year marriage went, went south. It, it, we ended up separating and divorcing. Um, and, uh, you know, I, and I realized in retrospect that the, the sexual content was part of me trying to cheat without cheating on my monogamous marriage. 
and I was never going to marry again, fell in love. And but neither my my husband, who I'm about to celebrate 20 years with, neither he nor I wanted to be monogamous. And uh, I'd had enough of it. So we have been polyamorous from the very beginning. And that that is my sexual orientation. It is it is it is not. Uh, and that is what makes me happy. And maybe if I'd had that that moment of reckoning in my own personal life, there'd be less less sexual content in both Anita and the Meredith Gentry series. But alas, you know, you can only look in hindsight and go, oh, that's why I did that. Um, <laughs> and I'm not unhappy. I did it. I love I love what I've written, but it's just you have these moments of epiphany where you're going, oh, oh, you know. Um, so, so. I and I've I was raised. My grandmother, she wouldn't tell me the boogeyman was going to get me. She would tell me raw head and bloody bones was going to get me. And in my research for the Mary books, I found out it was a Scottish nursery bogle. It's something you warn children to go to sleep for, or it'll get you. And so, of all the things to survive uh, in the generations of my family coming from the 1700s to this country, the the scary nursery bogle from the, the Scottish border country that's what survived. And that was fascinating to me. Um, but so uh, I had, there are nine books in the Mary Gentry series, uh, and there will be another one. But um, somewhere in, while well, I was both writing Anita and Mary, I got this idea. And I swear it to you, I wasn't writing, I wasn't reading on angels. I hadn't seen a show. To my knowledge, I wasn't thinking about angels. But this line came out of nowhere. And the line was, there were angel feathers in the dead woman's bed. And I thought, damn, that's a good line. So I wrote it down because you'll forget if you don't. I wrote it down, put it on the sticky note wall. Um, I have a sticky note area for Mary. At that time, I had a sticky note area for Mary, a sticky note area in my office for Anita. And then I had the sticky note of I don't know where this goes. And it went there. And for years, I walked past that line. I thought, damn, that's a good line. And I waited for my subconscious to catch up with it. But I know me, so I did start. Um, so I did start um, collecting angel books. I, I I I've learned I've learned to try to get ahead of it. And uh, and then about 2014, I had a choice of sitting down to write the ninth Mary, Meredith Gentry novel or um, sitting down. And I I was still hoping it was a short story. A short story with angels in it. So I sit down. I thought, you know, let's let's get this out of the creative log jam so I can write. And I had almost the first chapter done before I stood up from the computer. And I thought, damn, it's a series. It's another series. I can't do another series. It was 2014. I couldn't do three at once. I just can't. And I said, you're going to have to wait. So I put it in a drawer. And if I had written and I wrote the Ninth Marriage Gentry book, if I had written it then, uh, Zaniel and his world would be very different, I think. Um, I would actually not sit down to write the book knowing I was going to finish it this time until 2020. And I think that had the events of 2020 not happened the way they did and the world be so dark, I think that, I mean, I think the world would have been darker. My original plan was much grittier, much meaner, much just more film noir. I mean, that's still there and there are demons and really bad things happen to people. But Zaniel is a much more hopeful viewpoint on the world, a much more um, kinder, gentler viewpoint than I was really anticipating. And I think had all the intervening years from 2014, 2020 capped it off, but a lot happened in between. I think I needed all of that to happen before I could bring myself to sit down and do Zaniel and his world justice. Did, did you know from the beginning that Zaniel would, would have his own world? Like what, what, what is the, the thought process like for you um, of creating a new series with a new world, as opposed to having Zaniel drop into Anita's world or even Mary's world? What, what, like where did, where does, does so, it intersect for you? Mary and Anita could have shared a world, but I'd already written in book five of Anita Bloody Bones. I'd already written about the Fae in Anita's country, in Anita's version of, of modern day. 
And after I did all the research for the Mary series, I wanted to change too much that I'd already put in print. I would have broken my own canon for Anita's world. So um, I had to separate the two worlds. I knew from the beginning, uh, we've actually had angels on stage in the Anita books. Um, we had, a, we had, we had, a de we've had demons. We had a demon on stage uh, in book eight, Blue Moon. We had a, uh, we had an angel. We had an angel on stage in uh, Skin Trade. I can't remember what number that is, to be honest, of uh, Anita. So I'd already kind of screwed the pooch. Um, I'd already done things, and as I did more research, I, I didn't want to be tied to what I'd already written. So it had to be its own. But I also knew I was going to change enough. Uh, Mary and Anita could have shared a world. Zaniel's world is too different. It, 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 it can't be an either. Um, and even as I wrote the first chapter and wrote about the College of Angels and him being trained up to be an angel speaker, if, if either Anita or Mary lived in a world, especially Anita, if she lived in a world where angels were common and where everybody knew, like Old Testament things were still happening, Anita would have remarked on it in somewhere in those 28 books. So Zaniel's world had to be its own world. Um, it's easier if you hive them off so that you don't have to worry about continuity, which is, which is as a series gets bigger, a serious problem um, and not always something I do perfectly. But if you, there's pluses and minuses. If I tried to drop them into the world, Azania wouldn't have worked. Mary probably would have, it probably would have made my life so much easier, but maybe not. But it doesn't matter. When I have a new viewpoint, what I've learned is that the first book, either I do a lot of short stories that are not sellable, most of them, which is what I did with Anita. So when I sat down to write the first novel, I kind of have the voice, I have the world building, I kind of know what I'm doing, or the first draft of the first novel of that series is going to suck. It's going to be 70% garbage, 30% gold. The, say, that was true of the first Meredith Gentry novel, Kiss of Shadows, and I came to A Terrible Fall of Angels, which I love the title, came up with the title myself. I loved it, New York loved it, still love it, don't have any idea how I'm gonna get as cool a title for the second book. Anyway, <laughs> um, I, I knew that I came in, I was arrogant. This is my 41st novel. I'd written, this is my 41st novel. I thought I can do this. It doesn't have to be the disaster the first novel was of, of Mary. I, I know how to world build. I know how to do this. No, I don't. Or rather, it's part of my creative process to explore the world on paper. It's not enough to world build. It's not enough to make lists. It's not enough to make anything that you do, that, that most people do. I explore by writing. And so that means that the first draft of A Terrible Fall of Angels was the roughest thing I've ever sent to my editor because she's only been my editor for a few books. My first editor, uh, my other uh, retired, deservedly so. And um, so she got to see the process very raw for the first time. And we talked a lot about it. And I now realize and have to accept that if I ever do this again and write yet a fourth series in a new world, that I either have to do short stories in the world and explore it, or the first draft of the first book is going to be pretty terrible and we'll need a major, major rewrite. And that's just how my creative process works. And you cannot treat your, you can not cheat your creative process. Trust me, I've tried. I have tried to make it easier on myself. I have tried to, so often, I've, tr I've tried to, to I thought, I, thought I, I know how to write a book. Yes, I do but I'm building a whole new world. Now, in that first draft, uh, some of that 70% of quote unquote garbage is actually plot and character arc and story arc that will go over several novels. So it's not wasted. And there are scenes that are not wasted. Uh, one of the things I love about a series is the scene doesn't work in this book, but it will be great for another book. And I, I make outtake files. And for Zaniel, I now know I, I now know overarching, I know the, the big climax, and I wouldn't have known that had I not sat down and allowed myself to be totally terrible in the first first draft. And um, Zaniel, Zaniel, writing from first person narration is a male perspective for the first time for a novel, really intimidated me. 
because we 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 get on to male writers and say, oh, you don't write women well. You know, everybody throws stones at that. And I thought, well, the same can be true in the reverse. I didn't want that to be true for me. So I spent many of the years in researching not just angels and building the world, but also talking to my husband and everyone that I am close enough to that is male about what it is to be male. And um, it was... I finally realized I was making too big a deal of it. If I can write vampires and dragons, I can, you know, I can write just a guy. So get out of your way and write. But um, it's been, it was very interesting having the male perspective for the first time on paper. And especially because uh, Zaniel is, is six three. So he's, he's tall, he's physically imposing and male. And, very, very different from being a 5'3 female. So it was very interesting, you know, uh, as a woman, I walk into martial arts or I have, I'm a biologist, not practicing, uh, you go into science, anything that's male dominated, and you have to prove your right to be there as a woman, especially a small woman. You have to prove your right to be there. And for many years, I th saw that as purely sexist. And in some, most of the time it is, but if you're in an emergency and you, you have bad guys to fight and you're running for your life and you see a 5'3 woman or a 6'3 man, you can make a fairly safe assumption that hiding behind the 6'3 man is going to be safer for both of you than hiding behind the 5'3 woman. Now, if you know them personally and you know that the man has no experience in violence and will totally just be a victim or a meat shield and you'll get your friend killed, and the woman is former military, is a police officer, and you've seen her fight, and you know she's tougher, you go to her. But if you don't know them, and you want something physical to happen, and you need their help, it's practicality. And Zaniel got to walk into all the rooms for the police work, and nobody questioned him. He didn't have to prove he was tough. He's, five, he's six foot three. Everybody assumed it. And it was so relaxing. It was so relaxing to not have to prove ourselves every time we walk into a room like I do with Anita. Mary, it's not as big a deal. Mary is more comfortable being female. And she also is, you know, uh, the person she works closest with in the police officers is a, is a female detective. Anita is almost always the only woman in the room when it comes to her work. And so both Anita and I have to prove ourselves all the time that we have the right to be in this room and do this. And Zaniel didn't. It was so relaxing. I had no idea how much energy I spend to prove that I have a right to be someplace when it comes to uh, something physical or whatever. And, and when I talk to police officers that are female, they say that, no, Anita's, yeah, that's exactly, you have to prove it every time, especially if you're an attractive woman. You have to prove that you're not sleeping your way to the top. Zaniel doesn't get accused of that. Zaniel walks into a room as a police officer and they just go, oh, yeah. It was so, such less energy had to go there. Right. It was really shocking how less, how relaxing it was to have a perspective where nobody questioned his authority when he walked into a room. Laura, you mentioned that, um, you know, through some of the, um, uh, the, the in the writing of, of book one, there there were scenes that that didn't fit this book, but you have an idea of where those can plug in uh, later uh, on down the storyline. Um, do you have a a um, kind of an overarching idea of where the story is going? Is there a um, uh, you know, do, do you have an idea of the journey that you're going to go on with us or is each chapter, uh, you know, in the story, each book that you publish, um, is it, uh, you know, purely an act of, uh, of discovery as you go? Um, each book is an act of discovery. If I outline too, too completely, then it takes away the, the impetus for me to write. But for Zaniel's, uh, for Zaniel, Detective Zaniel Havelock, I do know the overarching uh, plot. But each book stands alone. 
um, it's going to be very much closer to how Anita is put together. So each book stands alone. You do character development and you do their life goes and changes um, from book to book. But as all of ours does. But I do know, actually, I do know the overarching um, kind of climax and where we're headed. And um, uh, it it is it. So, yes, I do know that. Um, I do not know, though what will happen next book. I have I have a list of events that will be in the next book. I think I know where I'm starting. I have two possible starts for the next book. Um, and I will, when the time comes, I will sit down at my, my computer and I will write one. And if that writes well, that's the opening. And if it doesn't write well, I'll try the other opening and see which one flows the best. Um, that, and that will dictate which way we're going for this plot. Um, I do know, I do not know what the main crime he will be solving will be in the next book. Um, and, and I have an overarching thing. It's interesting. Zaniel's priorities are very different than what I anticipated. And, um, his, his wife and child, he's separated from his wife. She has trouble being married to a cop. It's, it's hard. It's hard to be a detective, especially, and, and to have a, a happy home life. Um, and he just wants to go home. He wants to go home to his wife, and his, they have a three-year-old son, and he wants to go home. That's, that's what he wants. That's his overarching thing. He wants to catch the bad guys. He wants to save the day. He really is a reluctant hero and a white knight, but his primary focus is to uh, want to go back to his home. And it, you know, he was at the age of seven, he could see angels. So the college of angels scouted him. his family gave him up. And so from the age of seven to the age of 20, he lived in basically what amounted to a cloistered order, learning how to communicate with the angels and training in mystic ways. And then at 20, something so traumatic happened. He felt he could no longer serve there. And he ended up uh, out in the modern world when he'd never seen a computer. He did never driven in a car. He, he knew nothing. He just walked out and left that life and all those people behind. That was the only world he knew. So for him, the fact that he had married and thought he was going to spend the rest of his life with them, they had a child. He's, he's wanting to get back home because once he lost the College of Angels, he hasn't really felt like he's had a home since then until he made his own family. And I'm used to Anita and I with our very goal driven, got to catch the bad guy, got to, you know, we're, we're very, we're very work oriented. And strangely, Zaniel is not. And that again also was a surprise. I just, I love Zaniel. He's, he's one of those guys that He's the friend you call. He's the friend you call if you're in trouble. He's the friend that if you need to move a couch, if you need a shoulder to cry on, if you need to just go out and drink and let him watch you drink while you silently, you know, sink into whatever issue you're having, he would be there for you. He would wingman for you. And, uh, you know, I want him to be happy. Uh, he's like you want you want that friend that is the nicest person you know you want them to be happy and um uh, and i really do one of the interesting things i w i wanted to add though that what what zaniel and a man a large man especially a physically imposed man has to spend energy doing that anita and i don't is they have to spend energy not being threatening they have to, uh, I have uh, had a very dear friend that was 6'3", and uh, very handsome and very personable. And um, I said, you're always smiling. And he said, I said, I don't know how you do it. Because I was, you know, I'm cranky at heart. And he <laughs> says, well, if I don't smile, people are afraid of me. I said, no. He says, walk ahead of me. Walk ahead of me and watch. So I walked ahead and then I looked back and he stopped smiling. As soon as he stopped smiling, Women clutched their purses. They they made further away. Men got that look like trouble starts. I can't fight my way out of this. I, he's, he's very intimidating. And he didn't frown. He just stopped smiling. 
And then he smiles. And as soon as he smiles, everybody smiles back and women are flirting back with him and men are comfortable. And, and he comes, I said, Oh my God. So I knew going in, thanks to, thanks to my friend and other people I talked to that what Daniel has to spend energy on is not scaring people, not being intimidating by being six foot three and physically in shape. He has to spend energy, not, he has spent injury making people comfortable with him. And so Anita has to spend tr- energy making people trust that she can take care of herself and take care of them and, and be tough enough. But Zaniel has to prove that he is gentle and loving. And it's not just that he's not just the physical packaging. It was very interesting to realize that we all spend energy because of our physical packaging and socialization, we all spend energy we don't, we wouldn't need to spend except for how we look and what our, phys- what our, what our socialization around us is. It was, it was fascinating to look at it like that, to realize that difference in perspective. Well, I can't wait to see where you take the series and where uh, Zaniel takes us on on his adventures uh, going forward. A Terrible Fall of Angels is available everywhere now. You can grab it in Kindle edition or hardcover or audiobook. We're going to have links to all those in the show notes of this episode. Or go visit your local bookstore and support uh, support local, especially in you know when when businesses have had such a tough time. If you can. Yeah. Go support your local bookstore, please do. And uh, but you know, if you need to to buy it online, there's links to it in the show notes of this episode. Uh, Laurel, if people are just discovering you and want to dig into you know the forty something novels that you have, um, where can they find you online? Um, they can find me on um, they can find me on Twitter is lk hamilton. Um, they can find my website. It's Laurel K. Uh, laurelkhamilton.com um, and and I'm, I'm going Instagram Instagram what is it on Instagram it's slightly different um, I think it's official underscore LK Hamilton is that right yes that is correct and I believe that that's what's on Facebook but I'll be honest I'm blanking <laughs> I'm dyslexic we that didn't come in conversation but I am I'm dyslexic I, I didn't know I was dyslexic till I was in my 40s and I was already a successful novelist <laughs> But but I am dyslexic, so small changes like that in the address for things can be confusing for me. It's been interesting realizing. I just thought I couldn't spell. <laughs> I, I I also am dyslexic and and have uh, have had to learn ways to work around that, and it it can definitely be a challenge. Um, but a terrible fall of angels is available everywhere now. Go grab it today. Laurel, this has been so much fun chatting. Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. Oh, well, thank you very much, Hank. It's been it's been great talking to you. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. He led Jason to a small bistro. The door set tiny bells to chime as they entered. The place shivered with smells. Coffee, hot chocolate, and croissants. This, he said, extending his arm towards a woman in an apron, is Jennifer. She makes the best scones and is tragically spoken for. He kissed the woman's hand. She was plump in her fifties. She had left one curler to dangle at the back of her head this morning. If it's a tragedy to you, this is the first I've heard of it. She swatted at him with a menu. Why didn't you speak up twenty years ago, lady killer? Jason sat. Jennifer put a glass of water in front of him. And who is this fine gentleman? This said Hedwick, joining, is my son's great-grandfather's great-great-nephew. That's a lot of greats. Any great-great-great-whatever of Hedwick is great by me. She giggled at her own wit. I'll be back for your orders. Hedwick swatted her rear end with a menu as she left. He made small talk about the bistro, the specials, what was good, the Benedict, or not so, the hanger steak. When their orders came... Coffee for both, eggs for Jason, a scone for himself. He got down to business. I met your grandmother about, oh, a year ago. Valerie and I have a mutual interest in old families, particularly old families related to the legend, for obvious reasons. Valerie's lived in Terrytown for years, though her family's up near Boston. Now don't worry, 
I don't believe all that nonsense about a headless horseman. Valerie's the superstitious one. But the Van Brunts are definitely the family in Irving's story. Hermanus Van Brunt and his wife Agatha were farmers in the village back in 1780 or so. This was during the Revolution. Hermanus grabbed title to lands left by a Tory family who'd been tarred and feathered and shipped back to Britain. Do you know your history? Sure, Tory, loyal to the king. Benjamin Franklin broke with his own son who was a Tory. Smart boy. Traitors to the cause. And that was serious business. The British marched straight through here during the war, chased George Washington off Manhattan and out to New Jersey. And after they were kicked out again, a lot of Tories were kicked out with them. Anyway, the Van Brunts took over some farmland north of Terrytown. They had a son, Abraham. And, of course, their son Abraham married a wealthy heiress. Katrina Van Tassel. Yes. All that is true. It's public record, just like the legend says. My mother left behind quite a few documents written by Abraham Van Brunt. Brahm. In Dutch, mostly. He was powerful around here. With Katrina's money, he became the biggest stone merchant in the state. He died in 1850. After him, it's Dylan Van Brunt, his son, Joseph, the grandson, then Cornelius, then... Sorry, genealogy is not my thing. No? Why was Eliza doing research on the Van Brunts? She wasn't. She was looking into the cranes. That's what made us such fast friends. I don't get it. We do go back a ways, your family and mine. More coffee? Jennifer appeared at Jason's elbow. Hedwick nodded and she poured. Still not getting it, said Jason. But he did. Hedwick turned to the waitress and Jason knew what he would say. My lady, may I present? He raised his coffee cup, proclaiming, The last descendant of Ichabod Crane.